gives me great pleasure to introduce to you so the three personalities whom you all know and who are in charge of Zimbabwe's future. It's a pleasure to have here on the podium President Robert Mugabe, the President of Zimbabwe, Mongan Sangawa Rai, the Prime Minister, and also Untabara, the Deputy Prime Minister of Zimbabwe. Mr. President, I would like to add just a personal remark. I had uh, the first time the pleasure to see you in Davos, actually, and it was one year after you have taken on uh, the presidency. And of course, some of you will remember the um, Africa Summit, which we had in your capital in 1997. Uh, it just demonstrates the long relationships the Forum has developed uh, with Africa over the last, those, uh, last years. Let me make some remarks at the outset of this discussion. The Forum is a platform, non-political, neutral, independent. And I think the, the Forum has gained its reputation by having been the ancient catalyst <laughs> for constructive dialogue on many occasions over the last 40 years. So we want to conduct this discussion in the spirit of constructive dialogue. Second, we are also aware that Zimbabwe is going through some difficulties in its post-liberation time. We, we are here in this room only with one wish, to see domestic peace established and to see economic and social economic uh, success and social progress uh, of the country. We also know that it is at the end the Zimbabweans, Zimbabweans themselves who will determine their future. Now we have the three people forming a coalition and we are all eager to know how you envision the future of Zimbabwe. And I would like to call first upon you, President Mugabe. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Schwab. May I take this opportunity of expressing my gratitude for having been invited to this session on Zimbabwe. Uh, I stand here as one of the three, these three some that you see, is, is the three some that's running in Zimbabwe at the moment. And uh, age-wise, perhaps by comparative degrees, Young, younger, and youngest. <laughs> so, uh, there it is. But uh, what's, what's the background to it? Well, well, we are in a country which really has been the cradle the cradle of independence of the independence of various countries. The country which really has seen the foundation, the makings of what we are as an independent state in Zimbabwe. What they are in Mozambique as independent, but they are today without apartheid in South Africa, Namibia, etc and various others. And here was also the cradle 
of our own philosophies of how tomorrow after independence, tomorrow after our struggle, we shall run our countries. The political ideas that came our way from the gurus, the founding members of uh, the OAU, now the African Unit, the African Union, and in this country, of course, Mwalimu Julius Nyerere, his ideas, and Krumah, their ideas about development, their ideas about Africa, all that influenced us. But much more, we had the thrust international as we waged our struggle. We related to China, we related to Russia, we related to Cuba, we related to various other countries, we related to even Europe, Sweden, Norway, the Nordic countries, and so on. And the views of all these, we examined, we evaluated. And they were tomorrow to influence us. And so, as we negotiated our independence, and by that, uh, I mean on that subject, we carried out actually three negotiating campaigns from here with the British. 1976, October to December, Geneva Conference under the Leifa, it failed. 77, 78, we went to Malta, came to Tanzania, went to uh, Zambia, that was still Leifa, it failed. 79, October to December, under the Conservatives it succeeded, under Thatcher. And so we got our independence in 1980, April. And what was it to be? tend to be about those things we had fought for. The, the greatest or bitterest of all the grievances was the land issue where they negotiated it with the British Lord Carrington and the British had agreed to fund it. In other words, the compensation we needed to pay the farmers, the Qatar administration had supported, they had also placed financial support. And so we began. It was the land, land, land. No problem. William Byer, William Seller, we had rejected the principle that the British had originated to the Constitution to last 10 years. We agreed after 10 years we changed it. We were now to acquire land in the national interest. And of course, it didn't matter whether the farmer said no, the constitution now said land would be acquired in the national interest. And that was the main emphasis. Land, land, land to the people as a form of empowering our people economically, empowering <coughs> them also in terms of the realization of their sovereignty. Then, along the way, naturally, we decided that other areas must also be addressed. But although your economic forum it says it's purely economic and no politics, but the, the individuals you bring are motivated by politics. <laughs> and, 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 there, and so I, I have got to make reference to what happened. There were two parties that fought the struggle, Zapu Sanu, and right here in Tanzania, first of all, it was just Zapu who differed. And Zanu was formed when we were still here. Malibu said, you are one people. You can't go to the Geneva Conference 
as to unite. We talked, we united under the Patriotic Front. When we entered Geneva in 1976, we did so as the Patriotic Front. And as we negotiated our independence in at Lancaster House 1979, we had Ian Smith and Mzorewa and others. But when we got our independence, we felt that now that the independence had come, and the fact of its coming was the fact of victory for the people of Zimbabwe as a whole, whether you fought for it or against it, I say in March 1980, you are now part of an independent nation of Zimbabwe. You can, we cannot avoid you and you cannot avoid us, whichever stance you took during the struggle. And so, let's now work together, let's have our money, and we declare the policy of national reconciliation. And I said, let us turn our swords into plowshares in my speech. And so, I say to Ian Smith, Mr. Ian Smith, we fought against you. You imprisoned me 11 years, but bygones, let bygones be bygones. As long as we now all are one and there is loyalty from everyone, our sins of the past stand forgiven. We may not forget. But allow me to take four men from your side to join us in government. And we took four men. I, I made the choice. He said, now if you're going to take people from my party, don't you think I should choose them for you? I said, no, I'll choose them for myself. <laughs> so I chose the men I thought were more liberal and more progressive. And so, the fact of working with members of other parties does, did not start yesterday. If we could work with members drawn from the Rhodesia Front which had oppressed us, what was there to prevent us from working with him? This young fellow <laughs> of mine. <laughs> so uh, there it was. And uh, where we made the start now? After the elections of 2008, and there was an impasse, we disputed them. We said we had won. The front line, sorry, SADIC which emerged from the frontline states and the frontline states, you know, started here. Malimu, Tanzania, KK, Kamda, Zambia, and the Kama, the late Chief Kama, Botswana, and then, of course, you had the Samora Michel, Mozambique. There had also been a Dr. Neto, uh, of Angola, right? And they were the foundation of SADIC. Now SADIC said, this dispute about the elections will definitely ruin the image of your country. Why not sit down, negotiate, and come up with a government of national unity? And they gave us a facilitator from South Africa, former President Biden. We negotiated, we quarreled, we, uh, we started discovering each other. 
<laughs> we didn't trust each other. And actually we thought we, we, were, we, we were good pickers of each other. <laughs> but eventually we, it dawned on us that we were of one accord. We belong to each other. And uh, just now, yes, there are political differences, but we have that alliance. But unfortunately for us, is we are struggling now to make, you know, uh, a turnaround of our economy, and we have started doing it. We we have created a correct political in, uh, environment. We talk against violence. <laughs> we talk about uh, against any behavior on the part of our people which would be inhibitive of the process of unity that we have founded. And as, as we do that, we have also our experts working on the ideas of how we can turn around the economy. And we have had uh, programs, the first one, to, to try and start the economy once again from a low, the lower level where it was. But you have the burden of sanctions. The burden of sanctions. Why the sanctions should be imposed on us, we don't understand to tell you the truth. And uh, these from Europe and America are not from the rest of the world. And we say, but we have peace. We are forging now, you know, programs that will, that are meant to improve the economy, to bring about development. True, we have our policies. We want to empower our people economically. We would want them naturally to have a stake, a stake of our economy. Over the hundred years, the British have, you know, ruled us as through the settler government, our people were remain poor, poor in the extreme. But now we would want to see our people also share in the ownership of the resources, and that's why we have the indigenization and empowerment program. We've said investors will come should be prepared naturally for a sharing of equity in respect to the companies that will be established, whether in the mining or manufacturing sector. And our country should have 51% and they 49%. And that's the program. At the moment, people have said it, it will drive away investment, we say, no, it won't. A, a fair share, a mountain 49% is good enough. Anyway, we will discuss much more, perhaps, when you ask questions and make other comments. So, I want to end here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Prime Minister, Swank and I. Well, Dr. Swab, thank you very much for inviting me to share this uh, unique session. Uh, I want to confirm that indeed the polarization, the acrimony, the relations between various political actors, including between the President and myself, uh, is legendary. Uh, legendary in the sense that um, it almost tore down the country. But I want to confirm 
that at the end of the day, when Sadat facilitated the negotiation between various political actors, there was a, real, a realization that uh, there is no winner in a losing team. And that uh, indeed without this shared compromise, Zimbabwe was heading for a precipice. That was our motivation. So we signed the Global Political Agreement, we formed the government, and I want to say that the relationship within government uh, has produced what is now called the progressive development that has led to the progress that we enjoy today. There is peace, there is stability. Indeed, if there is a barometer of measurement of the progress in the country, it is the people of Zimbabwe themselves, across the political divide. 85% by the latest poll support the inclusive government. So that is sufficient testimony to the support this government enjoys. So it is not a fragile government. Yes, it's not perfect. Uh, we argue, we differ, but we differ respectfully, both at a personal level and in government. So what does this mean? This conference has noted that uh, this is Africa's moment. If this is Africa's moment, then it is also Zimbabwe's moment. And we cannot miss the train of any potential uh, investment that Africa is going to attract. As for capital itself, my message is very simple. Forget about the so-called perceived risk in Zimbabwe. In fact, your return on investment in Zimbabwe at the moment is much, much higher than compared to the other regions in other countries. So we look forward uh, to a country that is, has to go through rehabilitation, reconstruction, and your participation is welcome. As for us as political leaders, we can only say that uh, we have set the motion for a positive destiny for the country. And to me, that is more important than the acrimony that characterized the political discourse in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, Kutambara. <laughs> Professor Schwab, thank you very much for this opportunity to share with the investors and those who are here at the forum. What we're trying to do in Zimbabwe is to lay the foundation for a peaceful, prosperous, and democratic Zimbabwe. We're trying to build a globally competitive economy in our country. <coughs> As the leadership represented up front here, we take full responsibility for the failures and the successes of the inclusive government. In particular, we take total unequivocal ownership of the failures of the inclusive government. And this is a paradigm shift we're pushing for all Africans. Ask not what others can do to fix the African economy but what we can do as Africans to improve our circumstances. Yes, we know there are exogenous factors that affect our economies, but there are also internal factors we control and we can do something about them. Yes, we know the world is not a fair place, but in Zimbabwe, we are more concerned about the internal things, the endogenous factors we control. So those failures we have experienced in the past 15 months, we are determined to resolve as the leadership of the government of Zimbabwe. Before I go into what we're trying to do to build this prosperous nation, 
Yet that we raise what I call extenuating circumstances of mitigating factors. Will you appraise this inclusive government? Please do it within a context. Two years ago, this time, I came to the World Economic Forum from a jail cell in Zimbabwe. I don't know what I've done, President, but I was locked up in the country. <laughs> I came to the forum from the cells in Zimbabwe. At the same time, two years ago, the Prime Minister was going through a very tough runoff, which found him in the Dutch Embassy. Our Minister of Finance, the deputy, who you know very well, had treason charges around his neck. President Mugabe and his party were running the country on their own. Fast forward to 2010. Here we are. Mr. Morgan Shankara is now the Prime Minister of the State of Zimbabwe. President Gabi is now working with his former protagonist in the same government. And he was truly is a deputy prime minister. Part two. Coalition governments by nature are very difficult. You have three parties with three different directions working in the same arrangement. Even global best practice tells you it's a tough call. Look at the markets. The markets are only jittery about the possibility of a hung parliament in England, where there could be a coalition government. So judge us by the challenges that visit coalition governments, in particular ours, which is coming from those who were fighting each other, were at each other's throats just two years ago. Another factor, we are doing what we're doing in the country with skeptics throughout the world, with cynicism throughout the world. The IMF, the World Bank, the DFIs are very skeptical and very supportive of this arrangement. Those are the extenuating circumstances, the mitigating factors in the country called Zimbabwe. The Americans and the Europeans are skeptical and cynical about our arrangement. We still have sanctions imposed upon us. So those are the extended set of the However, we have made progress. Yes, there are two issues. The outstanding matters, which are talked about a lot. They are important. We are going to address them. All these problems, all these challenges are growing pains. They are taking problems in our arrangement. But more significantly, we have made progress. What is the matter of this government? Remember, we are coming out of a difficult election which had results which were contested and challenged. Key number one mandate is the creation of conditions for free and fair elections in our country. Why does that involve a national constitution, a new national constitution, national healing, media reforms, electoral reforms, political reforms, economic reforms. We are doing that. We've set up an anti-corruption commission. We've set up an electoral commission. We've set up a human rights commission. We've set up a media commission. The constitution making process is moving. The national healing of our nation is progressing. So we are making tremendous progress in so far as creating conditions for free and fair elections is concerned. In terms of the economy, we have set up the short-term recovery plan, we are launching the medium-term plan, we are building our national vision, we are building our Zimbabwe brand. So we are making progress towards a peaceful, prosperous and democratic nation. The part in short is this one. Yes, we are having some difficulties. Yes, we have some problems. But we are determined to work together. We are determined to make this inclusive government successful. This is why we are here meeting the investors. For new investors, please take a plunge and come to Zimbabwe for profit. Come to Zimbabwe and work with us in a win-win partnerships. If you delay, if you are skeptical, if you are dubious about Zimbabwe, it's your loss. Those who take a plunge, I'm going to make a very positive announcement. Thank you very much. Thank you.
the Putin Prime Minister. I think it was a very encouraging signal which we got out, the message which we got out of the three statements, because we have to look at the three statements um, not as individual contributions, but as collective commitment to the future of the country. What we will do now is we have a panel discussion which will be moderated by Julie Kichuba. And uh, you certainly will bring up some of the issues, particularly economic issues. So you will take care and introduce the panelists. Afterwards, afterwards, I will ask um, the political leaders uh, to react. But before doing so, I would like to, in, in the best Davos forum uh, tradition, I would like to integrate also the audience. So I will give the floor to some of you uh, to make also a statement and to raise issues. Uh, I apologize already now if we may be over time by 15 minutes or so. Any objection? No? No? Okay. So, Thank you, Klaus. Gentlemen. So, of course, we've had insights from the President. We've had the Prime Minister saying, come into Zimbabwe, invest. And the Deputy Prime Minister saying, we have had progress. Yes, there are challenges, but we've had progress. We want to hear now from potential investors, investors, and very important, the voice of the youth as well. But before I go to the panel, I just want to say, let us not lose this moment. Let us recognize the importance for this continent of dialogue of this kind. And we know in Africa that when we do not listen to each other with an open mind, when we do not hear each other and speak to each other, it can be disastrous. So thank you so much. Um, let me start with Bruna Alam, the CEO of Developing Partners International from the United Kingdom. If we can have a mic here for Bruna, please. Bruna, would you stand so everybody can see you? Thank you. Bruna, your organization has been investing in Africa for a while now. That's what, you know, it's one of its focuses. Just looking at the situation in Zimbabwe, what's your perspective on the investment climate and also what do you think should be done to improve the business climate in the country? Thank you very much, Julie. Your Excellencies, Dr. Schwab, Julie, thank you for the invitation for me to speak. Julie is right. We have been investing as private equity investors in Africa for a long time. For me personally, going into the 12th year, among our six partners, we have over 50 years' experience investing in Africa. So that's the perspective I come from in answering your question. I will also say our fund has two particular focus. One is to invest in companies that benefit from the emerging middle class. So really looking at the growth in Africa and coming in. And second, to look at newly liberalizing countries. From that perspective, we have been closely looking at Zimbabwe. We're engaged in dialogue and investing with several companies in Zimbabwe. So from that perspective, I would ask actually a different question. I'll get to your question. And that question is, why invest in Zimbabwe? Leaving aside all politics, 13 million people versus 150 in Nigeria. 13 million people, uh, 80 million in uh, Ethiopia a growth rate of 2.5% last year versus Africa growing at 5%, Angola and Ethiopia growing at 8 to 10%, Tanzania, Nigeria growing at 5 to 7%. So why Zimbabwe? And the reason we're looking at it is the following. Zimbabwe has extraordinarily educated people, which leads to extraordinarily good management teams and good companies. We as investors look at companies. That's where we start and that's where we end. So for that reason, one must look at Zimbabwe. And then the other reason is, because of dollarization and other reasons, right now in Zimbabwe, some of the prices of profitable companies are lower than replacing value for their assets. So it's a moment in time, as was mentioned by the excellencies. It's a moment in time. Getting to your question, um, it's a moment in time, but we as investors also look at several other things. We look at, yes, management, but also growth. So the companies we're looking at have, are lean and mean companies coming out of this environment, and they are growing, but their number is limited. So the country as a whole has to grow, and it has to be consistent growth, because if you look at other countries in Africa, for five, six, 10 years, they have had consistent growth with a few blips, but consistent growth. 
Second is that the whole macroeconomic system has to stabilize because what we look at besides growth is visibility of revenues. So if a country has ups and downs and ups and downs, companies in the, com in the country, it's hard to see when we look at projections what will be the earnings two years from now. We don't know. The company doesn't know. So that is the second thing. Another thing that we have to look at is essentially uh, beyond growth and all of that is what are the industries and other, other uh, companies that are developing? It has to be diversification of different companies and different types of companies. So one has to look at that. So macroeconomic growth, stability and consistency, and really empowering you know, capital to come in in an enabling type of environment. Thank you so much for that, Bruno. Um, next, we speak with somebody who already is in Zimbabwe. It's a very big group, actually, in several African countries. We are with Shingi Muneza. Shingi, please join us. Um, CEO of African Sun Limited. Now, as a Zimbabwean business leader, yes, You've invested in multiple sectors of the economy. What is your advice to foreign businesses interested in coming into the country? And we, we hear the calls coming. There's a lot of potential. What else would you say? Thank you, Judy. And uh, I, I pay respect to our leaders from, from Zimbabwe, my home country, born, bred, and probably will die there. Um, and this is a, 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 a defining moment to see our leaders at this conference in this fashion, in this format. And I, I would say that it is almost unbelievable. And I want to thank and give credence to them and to Professor Schwab for, for, for this moment. And, and I think it is good for our country. Uh, my job entails that I market Zimbabwe, whether there is uh, uh, stability or instability. So. Uh, sometimes I've had to live with the negatives in a real form. Let me say that as an investor in Zimbabwe, the first and the starting point has always been the confidence about the operating environment. And uh, this has been uh, uh, brought about, or this has been better, and there's been a complete shift uh, in the past 15 months with the government of national unity uh, because this has been, uh, the three leaders here have demonstrated the willpower to move on. And let me say that you only have to be somebody who has been in Zimbabwe before, during the crisis, and now, to appreciate where we are now. This is a complete 10, uh, it's a U10 from where we've been, as, as uh, masters of our own destiny. Uh, but about two years ago, our three leaders in front here to sit like this in any public forum would have been high treason uh, amongst themselves. So it, to sit uh, in this way, it is, it's a great moment. And, and if an investor does not see that, I don't know what they want to see. Uh, I, I really don't know what they want to see. The only expectation from me as a businessman uh, is waiting for these three leaders to do what I term as a revolutionary moment. Uh, a revolutionary moment is for them to deliver to us uh, a process, a system that will give us an uncontestable election. And, and that is the revolutionary moment that we await. Uncontestable. And I, I shudder to say free and fair because free and fair is almost like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. So, <laughs> It's difficult to, to determine what was free and what was fair. But I've learned as a businessman is that if the parties do not contest, even if the world thinks that this wasn't free and fair, that's fine. Uh, so we, 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 we are requesting them and we are nudging them and, and talking to them that they deliver that to us as business and the rest of uh, Zimbabwe an uncontestable election. And this does not take away uh, the revolution in President Mugabe. The, the change agent that is in Prime Minister Changirai and the history maker that is in Deputy Prime Minister Mtaba. <laughs> that doesn't take anything from them. Um, uh, and so we, we, we are looking at that sort of policy framework is, 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 is important for us as businessmen in, in Zimbabwe. Um, and I'm encouraging that this will 
uh, when we been to hell and back in terms of this situation, there was a moment where policy would shift almost every other day. And it was difficult to plan and, and do all sorts of things. So we had a monetary policy that was because we were using our own currency in a hyperinflation environment. It was difficult to plan to even make meaningful returns. But right now with the dollarization, that came just before the GNU was signed up or, or was commenced. It has really made us able to plan and deal with our issues uh, more meaningfully. <laughs> Um, and, and this has been a favorable, and also seen a favorable exchange rate regime. Uh, we are able to buy, sell, bring in services, and, and so on, in a parameter that is, is clear, and, and there is no hindrance, I must say, uh, to do any of that. Uh, this has been, uh, you know, a, a, a good development. The, the, the next policy, I think that, the, the stabilization of policy has been the biggest winner. We have stable policy. So when the monetary policy regime changed to what it is now, the next policy uh, uh, introduction was the indigenization uh, uh, policy. Now, let me talk a little bit more on that. This morning when I woke up and I looked in the mirror, I was black and I still remember that I was above it. So maybe that is the definition of indigenization. But I think the issue here is empowerment. I don't think anyone in Zimbabwe negates or debates against an empowerment of a post-colonial era. However, I think what is now being dealt with is the implementation which sends wrong messages around the investor community, including those of us who are in Zimbabwe. 60% of my partners in business are foreign. So we've got to make sure that we send the right message there. The engagement with the relevant authorities in government is there, and it has begun, and it's been progressive. I must say that it has been progressive from our part. So we, we see a process that will bring about a desired effect if we continue. So you are confident that implementation can be done in a, in, in a way that will maintain the confidence of I, I, I'm of confident. I will. If I wasn't confident, I wouldn't stand up here. And, and the real reason is that because this is being dealt with with a government of national unit, in themselves, they, they, they suffer a, a nation of some sort because there's a lot of things they have to agree. So we are cognizant of that, but I think that that is going to be a great one. And what we are saying is that any empowerment should produce economic growth, it should produce employment opportunities, it should produce foreign direct investment, it should also deal with poverty alleviation. So, so that's where we are on that score. So as a business, um, I, I would say what we need is capital injection here. Zimbabwe needs recapitalizing from top to bottom. We, we, our government is broke. Um, and it's not a, a, a secret to say, because if we were not, we probably would have done a lot of things on our own. But we need our partners. We need to be part of the global village. And that's, that's why we are still there. Thank you so much. Okay. I, I move now to Hosseini Damini, CEO of Old Mutual South Africa. Now, Old Mutual has had a long-standing relationship and engagement in Zimbabwe, Kuseni. Uh, you have a valuable historic perspective on the political and the uh, economic situations as well. The question is, what do you see as the opportunities in Zimbabwe? And also, what do you see as the risks? The first area of opportunity to me is just done just now, seeing the three sum in front of us here trying to rally all of us around the changes that are happening in Zimbabwe. I think what Zimbabwe needs are confidence building signals of the kind that we've just had here. If the leaders of Zimbabwe can take the spirit that has started here, I'm sure it has not started here, but it has been shared with us here, out of Dar es Salaam, take it out to South Africa, take it to London, take it to across the world, really start telling investors out there that Zimbabwe is ready for business, that Zimbabwe matters, Zimbabwe wants to be part of the world. I think that is going to take us far and it is going to assist us to deal with the concerns that have been, fa that have been facing the country. In terms of the challenges going forward, I think one of the main challenges which I'm sure is being dealt with is really the need to put an infrastructure and a policy architecture that encourages global competitiveness. I had the Deputy Prime Minister alluding to that fact. I think the first thing that we need 
we need to ensure that we have got stable and competitive fiscal and monetary policies in that country. Without that, investors will continue to ask some questions. <laughs> the third area of opportunity and challenge is really to address the infrastructure backlog in Zimbabwe. Luckily, Zimbabwe did not go through a period that resulted in its infrastructure being demolished as it was the case in some countries such as Mozambique and Angola. There is a basic robustness of the physical infrastructure in Zimbabwe. I think that provides an excellent platform to build the country, rebuild the economy, and uh, set a basis for foreign direct investment to come into the country. The third area of opportunity is the issue of energy security. I used to work in the mining industry before going into financial services, and we had investment in Zimbabwe from a mining perspective. The issue of energy was constantly an area of challenge in terms of some of the investment decisions that we had to make. I think if we can be able to unlock the energy deficit that is there, we can really propel Zimbabwe into growth and development in ways that are sustainable. There is even a greater opportunity for Zimbabwe to address its needs in terms of energy in ways that are progressive by tapping into the opportunities that climate change provides. It's a great opportunity to look at green energy opportunities, unlock and unleash a green revolution in Zimbabwe, create massive jobs on the basis of uh, more progressive, more enlightened responses to energy needs, not repeating the mistakes that saw some of our first world countries uh, committed when they were dealing with their developmental issues. And, and I also think that the issue of education and skills, although there is a point that was made earlier on by my colleague, that Zimbabwe has got good education, indeed it is, but some of the things that we've been seeing over the last few years create an, a, a, an opportunity to really rethink about further boosting the efficacy of the education system in Zimbabwe. The schools are there, the universities are there, but there is more that needs to be done to make sure that Zimbabwe continues to produce skills, not just for Zimbabwe, but for, for Southern Africa. Just on the policy issue, I'd like to appeal to our Honorable uh, President Robert Dabin, our Honorable Prime Minister Morgan Tsavirai, as well as Honorable Deputy Prime Minister Atam Tambara, to really look at making sure that whatever policy that we come with, we benchmark it against best practice in the world, in line with their collective commitment to make sure that Zimbabwe is conducive to investors. If we really would like to position Zimbabwe as a globally competitive nation, as indeed I think we can and must and will, we really need to look at benchmarking our policies with the best policies in the world. You may want to look at examples where a country is leading on health. If Cuba is the leading country on health, you look at their health policy. If Singapore is a leading country on um, energy policy, on, on economic policy, look at the Singaporean policy. It's not a question of picking one example from one country, but it's really looking at what works around the world, and looking at what is good for Zimbabwe, what are the domestic imperatives that need to be taken into consideration in order to build a very dynamic and formidable economy. And I have no doubt that we'll be able to turn around the corner. And I also believe that it's a huge opportunity for all our leaders in Southern Africa to also start having a regional perspective to the con continent's uh, growth and to the continent's policy development process. Because we are, are talking about 30 million people in Zimbabwe, 49 million people in South Africa. These are by all accounts very small markets. But when you start talking about SADC, talking about over 200 million people, it's a much bigger market. You're talking about now moving away from policies with the co chairs we were talking yesterday, we talk talking about the need to move away from better thy neighbor type policies to bolster thy neighbor type policies. So we really need to start thinking regionally and in terms of the policy architecture, look at what is best not just for Zimbabwe or South Africa, what is best for South Africa. Because our economies, economies are inextricably intertwined. And the way things happen or at a social level, economic level, and indeed cultural and political level, does not res respect the borders that are there. So it's really imperative that we have a much more robust, informed, honest, and open conversation around what is good for SADAC, what is good for the whole of Africa, so that we can really leverage the one billion people that we now have on the African continent to take on the best countries that uh, are competing with us, the best continents that are competing with us around the world. Thank you very much. Before we go, risks. 
When there are various degrees of risk in all the countries operating over 30 countries, we continuously do risk assessment in every country. We have been in Zimbabwe for over 100 years, and we I can concur with my uh, with the views that have been expressed here that Zimbabwe has got lots of opportunities, and we are looking at Zimbabwe from an opportunity perspective, and we believe that there are more opportunities there than threats. Now we're going to get a very important perspective. Bongani um, Nkume, I hope I pronounced that correctly, please. Bongani is a global change maker, and we want to know what your thoughts are. You're a young Zimbabwean. What do you think about the current state of the country, and what is your vision for Zimbabwe? Okay, distinguished guests. Please hold the mic up. Okay. Um, I'm the youngest of the youngest. I'm 21. <laughs> and I'm a global change maker. But standing here, I'm a Zimbabwean. And they've been saying, we, we, we. I'm one of those we's. <laughs> so I've been there. We've been there. I've bought a toothbrush for $10 million. We have been in a situation. <laughs> We have been there, we've been in the dark, but it is seeing this, this I think is the biggest emblem <coughs> of hope that we have. And I was sitting there and I saw after His Excellency finished speaking, he wanted to pass the mic to Mr. Fangirai. And that is something, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, I couldn't even imagine that. And sitting in Algeria with other students, when we saw the unity agreement and there were four of them with uh, President Tawun Begi, it was that we were all amazed and thinking, wow. But for me, the most important thing is we are now beyond party politics. We now have a brand, we now have an emblem, something to believe in. And that something is Zimbabwe, which is more important. And these men here are saying that this is more important than anything that has come before. Having said that, though, it's not perfect. And I'd like to challenge them and challenge Zimbabweans to improve, to continuously improve compromise. We have the Swiss, Professor Schwartz will say that, the Swiss are a good model of compromise and we are reaching there and I hope one day we'll reach that. And the second question, the future of Zimbabwe. We were having a meeting in the morning with Krasa Michelle and she said, we as Africans are the solutions to our problems. So I am an African, I'm a Zimbabwean and I believe I'm a solution. Like Runa said, we are excellent students. We are in Algeria there and we are excellent students and I'm proud to be that. So I'm a solution. And I remember talking to one economist from London on Wednesday, and I asked him, so what do you believe about Zimbabwe? And he said, Zimbabwe is doomed to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> we are doomed. We have it all. We've been there, we've done that, we have it all. But I believe. And I think that is something that is shared by many people. And I'm inspired, and I hope it continues. This is the beginning, I hope. And even after everything has come and gone, we still have that vision, that brand, that unity, and that belief in Zimbabwe, which is more important than anything else. And that is what I think as a youth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, those are the thoughts. You've heard the view of the youth and the, the investors. Professor, I'm going to hand back to you in just a moment. But first, we must commend leaders when they get it right. Please, let's give them a hand. Shake. You don't understand the difference that it makes on the ground. As a Kenyan, we sat there and looked at every side, and what you're doing right now is amazing. So we thank you for that, Professor Bhatti. Thank you, Shuri. Before uh, asking the honourable guests to, to respond to the issues, let me just take two or three. Um, statements from the audience to integrate everybody. So is someone here? Yes, please. Can you bring a microphone? My name is uh, Eric Kaku. I am from Cote d'Ivoire, and I live in Kigali, Rwanda. I think the tone of the session today has been very positive. It has told me about the future, and I think this is very encouraging for some of us who are amongst the youngest leaders in Africa. 
The question that I had was actually around this particular issue because I think it's very tempting when the problems are big for us as leaders to look in the rear view mirror and try to explain the representation of the past. The question I have is, what are you doing today as leaders to empower people like Bongani to make sure that your legacy in Zimbabwe is secure? So I would like to ask this question because I believe that it is the youngest has been absolutely honorable. I think it's, it's a sign that we definitely need. However, I mean, reflecting on everything that has been said here today, it's almost as if you're talking about a Zimbabwe that I've never been able to grasp in a Zimbabwe that's not a reality today. And um, from my point of view, as an investor into Zimbabwe, I'm asking myself, what are you doing to actually make sure exactly the same question that we bring the Bokanis into the mainstream? What are you doing to make sure that you're attracting capital? As you're aware, capital is a coward. And it doesn't go in areas where it, it, it perceives danger that is more than um, what is a commensurate return. And at this point in time, every time we look at Zimbabwe, we are afraid of uh, the policies that we are putting in place. We are afraid that something is going to change. It's not predictable enough. It's not stable enough. What are you going to do to make sure that the FDIs that you're talking about that you need in Zimbabwe, that the, that the missed opportunity that you're talking about, that the time for Zimbabwe is now, what are you going to do to make sure that Zimbabwe does not miss its opportunity now and in the future? It's an important question and I'm sure the uh, speakers will respond to it. Let me take maybe two other issues. There are so many, um, please. Uh, thank you. I'm a, I'm a Kenyan myself. Obviously, I'm younger than the youngest there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I must say that uh, I think Zimbabwe copied the, the issue of the coalition government from Kenya. We should be shining our own. <laughs> However, mine today is needed to congratulate the leaders I see there. Because I think you came up with us, and I think you have gone further than us. I think when I see that type of unity, I think there is something to take home. I must delay in the congratulations. Because the question of good leadership is very, very important for this continent. And that is what should be covered by everybody in this continent. Thank you so much. Question here, and some people and Mr. Lady here. But first, over here. My name is Richard Dowd and I'm the director of the Royal African Society in London. And I'm deeply grateful to President Robert Mugabe. Uh, in 1976, I was trying to become a journalist and he agreed, to, he was on a visit to London and he agreed to be interviewed and it was my first piece of journalism. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> I think I've interviewed you a few times since then. Um, my, my, I noticed that none of the investors raised the question of sanctions, and that was raised by the President. I would just like to remind myself exactly what the US and uh, European Union sanctions are, listed, uh, those listed sanctions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please. Uh, hi, my name is Sonia Rostoischer. I'm representing ADC. We are a German-based investor and we have invested in Zimbabwe. We invested in December last year and I have to say this is of course for us an important signal to see the three of you and I thank you for that. Um, however, I, uh, we do have concerns. We, we are invested and um, the discussion around indigenization is obviously um, a discussion that's very important for us and um, getting some more views from all three of you on the topic of indigenization and how that works together with encouraging capital inflows from other international investors into the country would be something um, that I would like to hear about. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have now enough uh, agenda issues and 
I may turn the sequence around and uh, we will end with his, his Excellency the President and we start uh, with you, uh, uh, Dr. Mutambara. Thank you very much. Uh, I think most of the issues addressed uh, by the panel and the audience speaks to the new agenda now. What we've done in the country is stabilization economics. We are now migrating from stabilization economics to growth economics, where we're saying job creation, disposable incomes, capacity utilization, new investment, and so that we can then start attracting investors and growing this economy in Zimbabwe. That will require that sanctions be removed. You know, and that gets to this question here. Even if the sanctions are targeted on the president, this minister, the army commander, even if the, target, the sanctions are targeted against the ZRP, the army, and the reserve bank, guess what? Capital is a coward. Guess what? Investors are circumspect. They will not come to a country where the president is on a travel ban. They will come to a country where the Minister of Defense is on a travel ban. So even if the objective is personal and targeted, the impact is for the whole country. We can't attract lines of credit, we can't attract investors. Sanctions must go today in total, whatever the type of the sanctions. Well, of course, we the Zimbabweans in this platform are now working together. We don't need them. Why should Europe and America patronize us and say that it's important to have sanctions when the Zimbabweans have spoken, when Sadat has spoken, when South Africa has spoken, when the AU has spoken? In terms of opportunities, we as a government are having a mindset shift, paradigm shift. We are not the doers, we are enablers, we are facilitators. So we are now moving away from owning the entire power utility in our country, owning the water utility, owning transportation. We are now moving towards partnerships. So there are opportunities for investors in infrastructure, there are opportunities in mining, there are opportunities in manufacturing, in processing, and we are creating an enabling environment around that. In terms of empowerment, it is not sustainable in a country to have the majority of the people as spectators in the economy. It is not sustainable in the long run, neither is it desirable. The majority of the Zimbabweans must be players in the economy. And by the way, it's not new. South Africa has done it. In India, you can't have a company in there with more than 29%, or speaking to all mutual. You can't get more than 29% in India. But all the big corporates are there in India. So when we say 49%, we're not our different from global best practice. What we need to do, however, is to package it well, to sell it well, to explain it, but there's nothing adverse because we're creating long-term stability by involving the majority in our economy. Last issue on the young people. How do we allow them to be active? I think it's a good question we must address. How do we make politics attractive to young people? How do we ensure the legacy is protected by new soldiers? new players, so that the independence of South Africa, of Zimbabwe, of Ghana goes on through new people. So we need to create systems and values and institutions that are promotive of talent coming in, that are promotive of new people coming in. But however, here's the other thing. Young people must also take risks. Be risk takers. Don't wait to be invited. Take a plunge. Like I did, and I'm taking prime in this <laughs> Don't wait for an invitation from the old guard, from the younger and the younger. <laughs> the younger and the younger. You must also make a sacrifice and take a plunge and become a player. Most of our best minds, Professor Schwab, in Africa are in the private sector, they're in academia, they're in journalism. And yet, public office determines the vision of the country. Public policy is determined by politicians. We must make sure we have a balance between the participation of our best minds in business, our best minds in academia, they must also come to the game of political gangsterism. But <laughs> don't have to take it like.
persuasive on uh, on the empowerment of the young people. The, the question I ask is, young man or young lady, what are you really? That's the question. First, we must make you something. We must educate you. And so our educational system must be a broad system that is available to every, every child in the country. And taking up all young people, at least to a secondary level, where they can make now choices as to which way to go. Then there are colleges, and with government has got to sponsor. The private sector must come in also. You see, and sponsor the development of skills. So after that, I want to ask you the question, what are you, young man? What are you, young lady? You already have skills. All you need now is the opportunity. And these are the opportunities now we are making available through indigenization and empowerment. Which sector do you want to go to? What skills have you? Are you an engineer? Or are you a professional? Are you a lawyer? Etc. Etc. And the choice then becomes yours. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Well, there are a number of questions that I wish to explain. The first one is, of course, the political challenge that she has, uh, has asked us as the three leaders. The question of elections. Surely, at some stage, there will be elections. And let's hope that those elections will be conducted uh, in a manner which is not disputed. So there will be an election at some stage. We deliberately avoided to set a date uh, for an election because we didn't want our people to go in an election mode, instead to go into a healing phase, create conditions, level the playing field, and then have elections. At the end of the day, the people of Zimbabwe will have to choose. And I hope that that opportunity will arise. So it doesn't even need to be revolutionary. It's something that is expected. On the question of uh, police consistency and certainty, I think that's what we are trying to do. Create predictability, build the confidence in our policies, build the national consensus because we are coalition. Policies are not just announced as a thumb-sucking exercise. There has to be debate in cabinet, in the council of ministers, with stakeholders, so that we arrive at a policy which has got an all stakeholder buy-in. And I'm sure that I'll go to the next one, which is indigenization. I know there's been a lot of hot air raised around it. But there are three critical issues I just want to explain. Citizen, citizenship empowerment in terms of the indigenization policy of Zimbabwe, that we are holding, does not mean nationalization. And I know that a lot of perception has been created that indigenization equals nationalization. That's not the issue. That's why one of the policy frameworks is how do we ensure that there is broad broad participation of the citizens. What modalities are we going to put in place to make sure that it's not an elite exercise, that it's broadened? Uh, those are the modalities we have discussed. Another critical issue on indigenization um, is the framework for sector by sector threshold. You can't have one size fits all. What obtains in mining is not necessarily the same that will obtain in mining. So you will have to discuss with each particular sector in order to set those minimum thresholds. And remember, the 51% the President was talking about is the ultimate. But what we are doing is that we have to start from somewhere if we are to empower the people in the generation of the people. Let me just try to attempt to deal with the other. Of course, we can't hope to revitalize this economy without a predictable infrastructure our roads, our railways, our energy, are very important enablers. 
uh, if we are to progress uh, and make sure that this economy progresses. Let me just go to other, other comments that have been made. <coughs> there are, we have talked about the, the empowerment. The question of uh, capital. You know, in June last year, I went to the United States, I went to Europe. The question that I was constantly asked, apart from everything else, what is your relationship with President Mugabe? <laughs> I said, what is so unique about it? We have a working relationship, we have signed an agreement, we are working together in government. What more do you want? Are you really sure? <laughs> And I, I went to the extent of explain, <laughs> I went to the explain to explain the fact that look, uh, you have very misplaced perceptions, and sometimes it has become an obsession um, about what you believe the real problem with Zimbabwe is. Yes, you may have your own position, but to me, as we push this country forward, President Mugabe myself may be part of the problem, but we are also part of the solution if we have to see this country through this crisis. So, some of these things like capital being afraid, oh, I can't go into Zimbabwe because for some reason this has happened and this has happened. I want to assure you that uh, uh, capital must be, as always, be bold, uh, must understand that there is no country without a risk, but it's your opportunity to make that risk assessment. And I can assure you that, uh, as I said, there is no return better than in a dollarized economy like this problem. <clears throat> Let me go to the Kenyan experience. <clears throat> yes, there may be similarities, but each situation has got its own characteristics. Uh, and I'm sure that if you were to analyze what is happening in Kenya, you may find some of the negative characteristics, but there's capital going into Kenya. We are not raised the same level of risk as Kenya. Why? It's different. And I think you need to examine each particular situation from its own perspective. I think we have more positives, as you have said and confirmed yourself. And, and, and I'm, sure that, uh, I'm sure that if you are in business... Now, let me deal with the issue of uh, sanctions. It doesn't make sense that people of the same government are not able to travel because of the travel ban. It doesn't make sense. I travel, President Mugabe does not travel, the other one travels, the other one is not traveling. That in itself is not an endorsement of the progress that we have made in the country. So all we are saying is that if we are people of the same government, look at us from the same perspective. Why do you select? We have agreed to work together and you must get guidance from what we are saying, not what you believe is going to say. I know that uh, a lot of people will have concerns. Uh, there will be concerns about HIV. There will be concerns about the level of crime, there will be concerns about every country has got its own negative. What we need to say is that, and what we are saying here is that Zimbabwe has its problems, yes. We are tackling them, they are not insurmountable. And people should look positively to say, this economy which has shrunk by 50% is on the map. It's actually on the growth path. Last year we grew by 30%, but we are coming from the negative. So you must understand that we are not actually shrinking anything. We have stopped the bleeding. We are creating conditions for you to make business. And I'm sure that what Shige is saying confirms it. And we want to assure you as the leadership of the country that we will do everything to ensure that we respond to your needs. We engage you as business so that we can provide the basis for a better takeoff. Thank you. Yes. Yes, they appear to be tar personally targeted, but actually they are much more than just personally targeted. I'm talking of the European version of the sanctions. 
The American version is quite clear, Zidera, the companies are not allowed to, to deal with us. So America has been much more honest than Europe. Europe says that the sanctions are personally targeted. I'll give you examples. Our economy in terms of its infrastructure, machinery, etc., and these by date of history is all wasted. We cannot get spare parts, but we can't get even new machinery from Europe because of sanctions. Mrs. Thatcher persuaded me, who were good friends with the Conservatives, to <laughs> Not, not that I support them. <laughs> I don't have any choices of any other. I assure you. But as she said to me now, if you're going to equip your Air Force, why, why don't you try the Hawk? It's a trainer, it's a fighter. And we, we spoke about it with my experts, the military, etc., and we got a squadron. It was a dozen plus one, 13. Now we can't get spare parts for them from Britain because of sanctions. And they're all grounded. So we're going to look east and replace them with mix from China. And, and this, this is the story across the board. We can't get spare parts. We can't get new machinery from, from the West. And that's how sanctions <coughs> have ever affected us. Let alone credit lines and uh, operations between banks. No, that does not operate. But America says, yes, this will not happen. It's, it's open, it's honest. Europe says, no, we haven't done so. It's only the, the sanctions that are affect persons. But in reality, they have done so. The practice of it is all sanctions. Thank you. Thank you. At, at the end of uh, this session, I, I would like to take up one issue which was mentioned the future of uh, Zimbabwe. And I would like to ask, since we are running out of time, each of the panelists to describe in two or three sentences how he imagines uh, Zimbabwe to be in 10 years from now. If you had to describe Zimbabwe in 10 years from now, how would you describe it? How would you like to see it? But in order to start, I would like to, to, to go back to Bongani and ask him first um, to, to describe how he sees the future. But don't take more than two minutes, please. Um, the British Council of Global Changemakers. <coughs> I see a future based on the dream that we're building, where we are now involved as youth, a dynamism created by this Threesome. I see a future full of vision and hope. Yeah. Thank you. Who would start, uh, Prime Minister? I think it's clear that the path and the destiny we have set for the country provides for a democratic, prosperous, and a member of the family of nations, a productive member of the family of nations, a competitive society. That's what I would like to see. I, I did my homework and I looked at your speech, uh, Mr. President, when you came to, to Davos. And at that time, uh, you said, we want to make South Africa and Zimbabwe a child. A child, you said at that time. Child. Giant. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what, what is your wish? Well, it's still a giant. 
Zealand giant uh, Shaw uh, in, in Southern Africa, apart from uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe has the, the best infrastructure, industrial and um, even educational, etc., etc. We we are above everybody else, um, and having that advantage of uh, that infrastructure, <laughs> an enlightened population, skilled young men and women, sure we we are destined for uh, that place. In, uh, in society of being a giant. But Mr. President, how would you how would you see Zimbabwe ten years from now? Particularly, how would you see it politically? How do I see? How would you see Zimbabwe in ten years from now politically? Politically, well, I see it continuing to uh, to de to develop. I, I see it remaining democratic and. Uh, don't tell us that there has not been any democracy in Zimbabwe because that's what we fought for, that's what we went to prison for, there was no democracy. We brought about the multi-party system and uh, we hope that continues, but it is up to the young people then uh, who will be in power to uh, sustain it. But the, the education we are giving them, uh, those academic and political through our own own example should should equip them to sustain the system and uh, I, I see a developed a developed Zimbabwe in 10 years time definitely uh, deputy prime minister mutambara you are the youngest in in 10 years from now you are only 50 if i'm not mistaken in 10 years from now yeah, in 10 years from now. In 53, 53. How would you see Zimbabwe? I have both a vision and a strategy for Zimbabwe. My vision for Zimbabwe in 10 years' time is a peaceful, prosperous, and globally competitive economy, which is in the top 50 on the GCI, the Global Competitive Index. And the strategy to get it involves an ICT-driven strategy involves entrepreneurship, involves moving from a donor-driven economy to an investment-driven economy. It involves moving from commodity-based economics to value addition and beneficiation. It involves making sure that there's technocratic capacity driving our countries. So this is the strategy I think can take us to a peaceful, prosperous, and democratic Zimbabwe. Ladies and gentlemen, this was certainly the most interesting session. But it was more than just a session. I think it was a commitment. Some people told me it's historical. I don't take it lightly. I think lightly. I think we will see in five, ten years whether it really was historical. But the session in any case was a commitment. We rely and we feel very comforted by your statements and we want to thank you very much for having come here, being with us, being all the three of you with us. Thank you very much and we wish you in your undertakings all the success which you need in order to make Zimbabwe a prosperous and peaceful country. Thank you.